<laughs> so we're delighted to have Father Kenneth Hamilton with us today. Father Ken is a divine word priest. He received his PhD from the Union Institute and University, the alma mater of the great Clarence Rivers. In 1993, with several other divine word priests, he started the Bowman Francis Ministry, a special ministry to uh, African-American youth. It was named after Father John Bowman, Bishop John Joseph Francis, and Sister Thea Bowman, three of the greats in African-American Catholic ministry. He currently is at St. Patrick's Parish in Oakland. He's a noted liturgist, tremendous preacher, all around good guy. And uh, just to point out that, that today's date is 2-22-22, it's Tuesday. And I want to present my twin, Father Kenneth Hamilton, to preach on the six Black Saints in Waiting. But we're going to start with a short video that'll put this into some perspective. None of the saints associated with the Catholic Church in the United States, none of them are of African descent. But an initiative by the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in New Orleans wants to raise the profile of six Black Catholics, women and men who the church believes have saintly potential. Let's learn about these six extraordinary Catholics. Pierre Toussaint. Mr. Toussaint came to New York from Haiti in 1787 with the family that held him as an enslaved person. He worked as a hairdresser and was eventually released, becoming a formidable fundraiser, especially in support of Black Catholics throughout the United States. He opened the first Black Catholic school in New York and raised funds to start the city's first Catholic orphanage. When yellow fever broke out, many powerful and wealthy people fled the city for the countryside to escape infection. But Mr. Toussaint remained in the city to serve the sick and dying. Henriette Delille. Sister Delille was a nurse, teacher, and caregiver for the impoverished of New Orleans. Many of the people she cared for were Black enslaved women and children. She founded a religious order of consecrated women in 1837 called the Sisters of the Holy Family. The community welcomed senior women into their home and cared for them through serious sickness and death, especially during the yellow fever epidemic of 1853. She opened schools for enslaved children of color at a time when educating them was forbidden by law. Augustus Tolton. Father Tolton was the first publicly acknowledged Black diocesan priest from the United States. He was denied entry into any of the country's seminaries and forced to pursue studies for the priesthood in Rome. After ordination in 1886, Father Tolton asked to serve as a missionary in Africa, hoping to escape the racism in his native land. Instead, he was told to return to Quincy, Illinois, to which he and his mother had fled after being released from enslavement in Missouri. There, Father Tolton endured the racist attitudes and actions of the local white Catholic clergy. In 1889, Archbishop Patrick Fian of Chicago invited him to minister to the city's Black Catholics. Five years later, Father Tolton had built and developed St. Monica, a Black Catholic parish of about 600 people that became a national beacon for Black ministry. Mary Elizabeth Lang. Mother Lang moved to Baltimore, Maryland in 1813 near Cuba after fleeing the revolution in her native Haiti. In the US, she used the wealth she inherited from her merchant father to provide free schooling to Caribbean migrant children. At that time, it was illegal for enslaved people to receive an education. In 1828, more than 30 years for the Emancipation Proclamation, Mother Lang opened a school for girls of color 
and asked permission to establish a religious congregation for Black Catholic women. The Oblate Sisters of Providence were founded in 1829, and Mother Lang served as its first provincial superior. The sisters educated Black children and delivered adults, cared for widows and orphans, and offered support to many people during the cholera epidemic in the 1830s and 40s. Julia Green. According to enslavement in Hannibal, Missouri, Ms. Green gained her freedom and moved to Denver about 1878. She worked as a housekeeper, and the little money she earned is said to have been spent almost entirely on care for the disenfranchised. To spare white families the embarrassment of receiving charity from a black woman, she often carried out her charitable service at night. Ms. Green was baptized and received into the Catholic Church at the Jesuit Parish of the Sacred Heart. In 1901, the Angel of Denver, as she became known, professed vows in the secular Franciscan order, remaining faithful to her promises until her death in 1901. Few people have tried to get the U.S. bishops to stand together and sing, but in 1989, that's exactly what Sister Thea Bowman was able to achieve. Inspired by the actions of women religious and priests at her school in Canton, Mississippi, she became a Catholic when still a young girl. At 15, she joined the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration and became the order's first Black member. She earned a doctorate from the Catholic University of America in 1972 and was a founding member of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in New York. A teacher, singer, writer, and evangelizer, she delivered public lectures across the country as a sharp critic of racism. She died in 1990 of complications from bone and breast cancer. Each of these six extraordinary individuals witnessed to Christ in their own unique way. Let us pray that their causes move forward and that people everywhere will learn from and be inspired by these bold and faithful Catholics. Learn more at americamagazine.org or click the link in the description below. Okay, so we will turn it over to Father Sun. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Dr. Burns giving us full props here. Um, and Sabina, um, who uh, I'm hosting me at their home while I'm here, uh, suffering in the terrible weather of San Diego. But people apologize to me about all the time. And I'm from Chicago. Figure. <laughs> To everybody who was here today, thank you so much. And for those online, I had to invite a lot of my friends because you know you never know who's going to show up. You want to make sure your family's there at least, you know, to give you props. Amen. But in a very special way to the Center for Catholic Thought and Culture and to those who have invited me today. I thought that that small video would be a way to briefly introduce you to the particular subjects I've been asked to speak on uh, this afternoon. But if, as in all things, the question is always, always, how shall I tell their stories? As a Black Catholic leader whose community faces the challenges of lost parishes and lost vocations, lost schools, how shall I frame the stories of these six very unique Black Catholics? Saints in the waiting are important, as is the politics 
around the process of canonization. That too is important. What will happen as these holy persons progress through the Roman processes? How will, I, how will their stories be told and how will they be seen in a larger Catholic imagination? The answer, of course, is they will be framed in certain ways, some more official, some more grassroots, both sides of equal importance, actually. I don't know what will unfold for these six persons, but in this talk, I would try to do three basic things. Number one, let you know the central principle under which all persons coming from peoples who were conquered or enslaved, particularly African or Afro-Diasporic persons should be framed, in my opinion. Secondly, I will try to give you the brief historical context of how many canonized persons belonging to those peoples in conquered or enslaved have been framed over the last few centuries. Thirdly, I would try to imagine a couple of liberative ways that the men and women here might be seen in years to come. In so doing, it is my hope that these six will become more authentic and believable heroes and heroes for future generations of Catholics of all colors. I'm reflecting today, particular about those Catholics of colors who for the last four centuries have seen Christianity and in Christianity, the loss of their indigenous cultures who have lived inside the church with split identities, who have always faced cynicism regarding their true holiness, who have had to resist the dominating drive to be whitened, to be made non-threatening and docile, or whose spiritual and religious legacies have been trampled upon or simply denied. How should they be framed? What is the basic thrust of their lives by which they should be judged? Is it purity or chastity? Is it obedience? Is it private devotion? Or is it their capacity to endure suffering for suffering's sake? In Black, Catholic, and liberative theology, it is none of the, these things that centers their lives, of course, not purity, nor obedience, nor devotion, nor endless suffering. That principle at the center of their lives is the same principle that has been at the center of so many lives of oppressed people over time, the desire to be free. And that is why the slave would sing the song, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And before I be slave, I be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And another traditional song goes to say, and speaks of a basic land of freedom beyond. It goes, I'm on my way to the kingdom land. I'm on my way to the kingdom land. And if you don't go on my journey, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. And still another speaks of that kingdom land as a land where I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When we get to heaven, gonna put on our shoes, gonna walk all over God's heaven. Heaven, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven, I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Freedom is the overall black theological and political project of the last 400 years. Freedom is the basic principle of the enslaved. Freedom is the creed of a God of the enslaved. That's how these six should be judged, by the canon of freedom. Yet, it has not always been that way. Of course, we know that's why we're here today. Canonization either relates to or simply seeks to ignore the real lives of real people in this world sometimes particularly over the last few centuries, the lives of people of color have often been framed by those who sought to Christianize them by subduing in them that which makes them fully human, their personalities, uh, their emotional spiritualities, their cultures and their political strivings. 
Because of this, one has to ask who became worthy of canonization in past times. The men and women canonized over the last four centuries or so of many colors lived inspiring and yet very complicated lives. Yet there is always this enduring intention to erase these complicated lives and fit them to a rather narrow, even European perspective, make them into more docile figures, at least from the point of view of the white European men who wrote the theologies, the men who erected the ethical standards over heathen figures and filled what they considered empty spaces and lands uh, with their own narratives, spaces that supposedly had no histories of their own. What it made it worse, of course, is that these same white men often arrogantly refused to interrogate themselves through it all. This has meant that what would have been the real stories suddenly become what I call the backstories, the story from the slave quarters, the kitchen, and the fields. I believe that unless we see these persons and see the ways they lived their, in their bodies, dealt with the dominating structures of their time, suffered redemptively, we ourselves will continue the colonizing project canonizations have been a part of. It's my opinion that these persons and the devotions we form to honor them must rather be put in the light of an ongoing struggle of the decolonization of our spirits and minds and bodies. The canonical process under which these six candidates will be judged, the stories or hagiographies that will be told about them, and the way that they will be appropriate in certain Christian theologies belongs to a matrix of stories that emerged at the ages of European discovery, exploration, conquest, and settlement that span from the early European conquest of Latin America through the period of slave trade into the age of lynching and the new imperialism, and even into the period of decolonization in the 1960s. It particularly covers the years of the modern constructions of race, sexual identity, gender, and class. These six stories will sit in a long line of stories that combine colonization with imperialism, with issues around sainthood, martyrdom, and notions of purity. That's not to oversimplify what happens when evangelization and colonization come together and happen at the same time. Colonization and enculturation are complex processes to be sure. Alan Greer and Jody Bellinkoff write in Colonial Saints, discovering the holy in the Americas, 1500 to 1800, that quote, over the decades of missionization, resistance, conversion, accommodation, fusion, and reinterpretation, new religious forms emerged incorporating traditions from both sides of the Atlantic. Yet what is notable about colonial hagiography or the way saints of color have been appropriated by Europeans in this time period is the way saints of color, or rather is the coincidence of things. For just quote, when images and stories of ancient and more recently deceased spiritual heroes were proliferating across Catholic Europe, Europeans were making contact with the Americas and their indigenous people. So any understanding of these same stories must also include the historical fact that as they write, the colonizers and evangelizers came brandishing swords, guns, and crosses to the battle cry of Santiago with statues of Our Lady, books on the lives of Catherine of Siena, and Anthony of Padua and planted these hagiographies into new soil. A few examples of these past canonizations may illustrate my point. Famous New World Saint sagas from the 15th to approximately the 18th century and further include those of Margaret de Pores and Rose de Lima of South 
America, Isaac Jobes and his companions, Katarik Tekawitha and Unifico Serra of North America, and Juan Diego of Mexico. All of these hagiographies involve complicated questions of race, colonial identity, and proto-nationalism. They raise the issue of the political dynamics of canonization. We don't think about that a lot. And revolves around the fundamental issues of race and class that were thrown up by the impact of European colonization of Indian peoples and the enslaved or not enslaved Africans. My close examination of the erotophobic, sexist, and essentially theologies that sometimes developed over the past few centuries makes Roman canonizations of this period appear a little suspect or at least worthy of investigation. For instance, the story of Blessed Catherine Tekawitha of the Mohawks became what you might call a hagiographical tour de force because her story convinced the Europeans, filled as they were with fears of race mixing and the conviction that chastity and Indian women were contradiction in terms, that native peoples could acquire sanctity, but only through Christian conversion and fervent faith. Take a with the story. Her story had to be told and altered by her hagiographer in such a way as to remake the erotics of imperial conquest, wherein dark women's bodies were often boundary markers for empire. And European conquest was filled with imagined imageries of entry, possessing, ravishing a feminized land. Tekawitha had to be presented to the world as the first Iroquois virgin, as an exotic other who nonetheless had heroic potential and was thus familiar to Europeans. There is a similar theme in the hagiography of Charles Luanga and his companions of Uganda, who were martyred later in 1886 for supposedly refusing the sexual advances of a demonized king, Mwanga. Their martyrdom marks, and I would argue, makes a pathway for the transition from Buganda to Uganda from the independent former nation to the colonized land. The Ugandan story had to reconcile two seemingly irreconcilable notions for the European Catholic. Africa on one hand and pure saintly boys on the other. Lawanga and his companion are now constructed by the, main, by the white missionaries as the African Dominic Savios. He was an Italian boy renowned for his priceless innocence, unquote. Theologian Donald Bosford, reminiscing about his childhood and the images of Dominic Savio, Aloysius Gonzaga, and Stanislaus Kotska, writes that they, quote, embodied the perfect model of boyish, boyish chastity and purity. The question is exactly how these Catholic European constructs of boyish and or childish innocence, particularly as submissive children open to evangelization are understood given the so-called untamed primitive and perverse geographies in which Europeans thought they inhabited. Africa for the missionaries was a self-depicted as the last child on earth to be civilized or adopted. How does the notion of docility in the noble savage Rousseau give an opening, much like the stories of Pocahontas and La Malinche, for the colonizing men to enact violence, to defend purity, to write their conquest as a love story? between a mother of nations and the new fathers from across the sea. You get the dynamics, I'm sure. In the same vein, there is no doubt about the legacy of the missionizing of the Americas. In a recent sermon I preached back in Chicago to a Pan-African Catholic community, by the way, at the home of Augustus Tolton, I began this way. 
as I come to you today on Mission Sunday, I'm reminded of the ground on which I stand. The native people who lived in these lands, the black possibly Haitian founder of this town we call Chicago. On Mission Sunday 2021, I said, I acknowledge the people of color who came from many places, but whose memories were erased or who became shallow cartoons that needed detail and artful arrangements. I think I can see these people, I said, evangelized by missionaries who told them about salvation in heaven, but said little about liberation on earth. In these lands that we all inhabit right here, the story must be told in actuality that black Catholics go back to the beginning. 1536, the ex-slave, uh, the slave Esteban, though born in Morocco, was baptized Stephen, a Christian man. And he joined other three men in their mission to evangelize and baptize the so-called heathen Indians of the land. By all accounts, Esteban was a resourceful, intrepid explorer who survived shipwreck, disease, captivity, and physical hardship as much as by his wits and personal courage. Yet, the Jesuit priest, Father Alonso de Sandoval, leaves a grim picture of the conditions of slavery under which Esteban's kin must have labored. He wrote that, quote, the typical African, whether agricultural laborer or household servant, toiled from dawn to dusk went about with very few clothes. He actually wrote naked, I just put it down. Unless she worked on Sunday, these days to obtain money for clothing, was miserably fed, received no medical attention, and was harshly, even sadistically punished for the most frivolous reasons. In fact, Father Sandoval believed that Christians punished by their slaves, they punished their slaves more in a week and then Moors did in a year. But in the midst of it all, by 1579, a black saint for the Americas had been born, Martin Duporis, was a man who cared for the poor and did the menial work of a servant for the sake of others. And yet he did it in the name of Jesus, of course, the master who unlike his and those around him broke chains rather than imposed them. And so now, as we prepare and present the cases for the poss a possible new set of saints, how do we tell these stories from the point of view of those who live in their own skin and gender and innate spiritualities? How about this, can we, who benefit from a vision of freedom, redeem our history and paint a future anti-racist, anti-sexist way for all of us? As a theoretical background to this, let me first say that I believe as a student of religious studies, like we all are, that we have the right to interrogate our religion because the very nature and develop, development of belief, particularly Kemetic Judeo-Christian religion, is determined by three things. One, it is always about responding in faith to new historical exigencies such as slavery and Jim Crow were. Secondly, true liberative theology is about the growing imagination about what faith and freedom mean and the expanded horizon this implies. I think that's what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. And if you think about it, the very process of missionizing and enculturation of our faith implies a belief in expanding theological horizons. This is in sharp contrast, of course, with those who preach the Christ event as a reified, exclusive, dominating Euro cultural perspective. In such a perspective, nobody's past counts and nobody's life matters except their own. In the process, of course, the very soul of their own past, ironically, is lost. As the poet Nikki Giovanni writes, I know why the caged bird sings. And Ernest, Ernest Hemingway knew for whom the bell tolls. That is to say, in the process of erasure and control, 
our very Catholic identity is also lost. Amen. Thirdly, and most importantly, I think in the church now, we must interrogate these lives at their depths because a theology of stories, a narrative theology, holds that salvation history is not developed in dubious meta narratives about manifest destiny or as superimposed moralities based in the denial of the seen body in favor of a rarefied one, nor in false binaries like white over black, man over woman, Christian over heathen, but in real stories, real stories of overcoming faith. These, the first shall be last and the last shall be first backstories are the ones who reveal the God, Jesus Christ. Recent attacks suggest that such Eurocentric and racist expressions still exist to silence true black consciousness and thus reimpose chains. I think specifically of recent statements made by Bishop Robert Barron and Archbishop Jose Horacio Gomez of LA that imply that any expression of freedom by black people or black Christians are to be relegated to pseudo religion or to Marxist or leftist French philosophy. This of course is an attempt to erase the voices of black political faith leaders, an attempt as black Catholic scholar Brian Rati has just written in the NCR of the legacy of a black prophetic tradition all around us that is not seen. Even in the critiquing of European leftist theories, they forget that many of them, such as Marx, Derrida, and Foucault, were born out of a spirit of emancipation against racial capitalism and in a growing environment of anti-colonialism. Sadly, and thank you, Jeff, for this, both bishops also seem to be ignorant of the fact that the Catholic Church itself now forged in the shape of the Second Vatican Council was largely influenced by the growing anti-colonialism of Black Catholics in African seminaries and Black Catholic leaders educated in the Catholic missions such as Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Patrice Lumumba of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In an atmosphere then of the demonizing of Black political strivings, the six African-American saints in waiting push us to tell of Black Catholic lives, real lives, detailed lives, and speak truth and power to those who seek it. Let me start then with the mother of Black Catholicism, Thea Bowman. I'll call her that because before Thea, we were either Black or Catholic. After her, we got to be both. Sister Thea has been called the rhetorician of the real. In her own words, she came before the bishops like you saw and asked, what does it mean to be Black and Catholic in the church? It means that I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my Black self. I bring my whole tradition, my experience, my culture, my African-American word and song and dance, my gesture and movement and teaching and preaching. In other words, my whole self. So Sophia was dedicated as RSM's sister Christian Kuhn said to the three simple spiritual principles liberation theologian John Soprino lays out, honesty about the real, fidelity to the real, and the willingness to be carried along by the ever expanding and even startling possibilities of the real, of being real. If we take courage and confidence, I believe, from Sister Thea, who brought her reality, her, her whole self to the church, the possibilities are endless. And what of the man who escaped slavery? to become the first black ordained man in the United States. Like the African Saint Josephine Bakita, Augusta Totem was a slave who longed for an escape to freedom. From slavery in Missouri, through the underground, 
across the Mississippi into the apartheid Catholics of the Catholic Church in so-called free states, to Chicago to face the huge burden often placed upon Black priests to minister in the Black community is to speak for fellow Black Catholics, ending up in a premature death at the age of 43. Still a grim cloud hangs and hovers over priests of African descent in this country. And because of it, we who labor in the church still evoke the claim that St. Augustine, St. Augustine Tolton is our patron saint, whether he's canonized or not. <laughs> On a personal note, I could speak of myself as a son of Tolton and lift up the fact that the way Augustus Tolton was treated in his time is the way Black American priests are sadly often treated to this very day. Recently, a group of young and <laughs> not so young African-American priests found the need for an ongoing support group in the light of the numerous Black priests' deaths over the recent years. We have found ourselves simply trying to survive in the Catholic Church. As a Black priest, Tolton continues to be a patron for us, along with other Catholic leaders who are still targeted as troublemakers for the mere fact that we actually do love our people. Right up there in Oakland, as a matter of fact, there is the undertold and ignored story of Father Clarence Howard, SED. He was a pioneer in many ways here in California. Some say uh, he caused, as publisher of the St. Augustine Catholic Miss Messenger down in Mississippi, too much trouble in the South and was thus transferred to California. But he was a man who kept his eyes fixed on freedom land and did things like ally himself with some of the work of the Black Panthers on the west side of Oakland. There's something in the life of Father Tolton and Father Howard that reminds me of the image of the Black Christ of whom the, uh, the poet County Cullen wrote, evokes, quote, the world supremacist tragedy that until we die, our burden will be how amazing it is, how, quote, Calvary in Palestine now extends to he and mine. Before I leave Tolton, I know Mother Thea would want me to also say that Tolton can help us focus attention on the building up of Black Catholic community in particular, and help us to see how much we still need strong anti-racist allies like he had in Father Peter McGeer in his time, the Irish priest. Because of these allies, men like Tolton, Black Catholics can see how important it is to support other humble priests and sisters of various races and cultures who come into our parishes here in the United States. As Mother Thea would say, let us help these men and women who come into our community who are willing to listen rather than to come into the Black community filled with arrogance. She would say, let us support bishops who include Black leadership in their del deliberations about Black parishes, because many other bishops, often too eager to sell them away, merge or relocate them. Okay, and what of Pierre Toussaint? For me, he is a sign of a Pan-African unity that serves one purpose, and that is the purpose of freedom. Toussaint, as you know, raised money to start Black Catholic schools and orphan, not just as some act of Christian charity, as some simplistically frame it. What he also did was to assert that these Black children's lives mattered, that Black advancement matters, that Black economic power matters. Toussaint believed in survival, we all do, but also in giving our children the tools for future liberation. For me, he's an example of the need of a true pan-African Catholicism where unity equals real power. Across the diaspora in the Black Catholic parishes from his own New York to Los Angeles to Port-au-Prince to Brazil to Rwanda and Uganda. All I can say that I was so inspired the other day when I looked upon that great source of intellectual endeavor, YouTube, and saw a picture of a young black man 
a young priest of Haitian descent who had named himself Father Pierre Toussaint. As a man of Haitian descent, like the newly named Bishop of Charleston, that young man comes from a legacy of Pan-African Catholicism, but also manifested itself in the life of Mother Mary Elizabeth Lane, the founder of the Black Oblate Sisters of Providence of Baltimore. These Black sisters can be found on another YouTube video, that's where I get my sources, where they are singing, believe it or not, the words of the Pharrell Williams song, Happy. It was a vocation video, you'd love it. You might remember the refrain, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel that's what you want to do because we're happy. In this vocation video, we witnessed the police black Catholic sisters, some of them working actively in ministry and allow them in wheelchairs, praying for the church still. We witness that they can still be happy because happiness is the truth. Endurance is the truth. A happy dedication to the descendants of the slaves is still the truth. And if this is so, then Mary Elizabeth Lang of Baltimore illustrates the often unseen image of black joy. Next week in Oakland, by the way, I intend to uh, attend the Black Joy Parade, if they don't cancel it, uh, where they say all invited to be created, be open, be present, be free. To be created and open and free was a necessary mantra of a woman who also traveled the Pan-African routes from San Domingo, San Domingo through the Haitian Revolution to safety and education in Cuba and to the racism of South Carolina and Virginia, and then finally to settle in Baltimore. Where the language was created in the founding of an order for black women. She was open to the gifts of the spirit. And she was free, always free. She was a black Catholic pioneer, much like Mother Aria DeLille of New Orleans who was born into the swirl of both white racism and eternalized racism between Black people. Blacks who sometimes use the famous paper brown test on other Black citizens. In other words, if you were darker and then a paper bag, you were too dark. Imagine, use your imagination to imagine the delicate scene in which she, the light-skinned great-great granddaughter of a slave, began her ministry. In New Orleans of her time, there were 60,000 white persons, 19,000 free, and 23,000 that were still slaves. The situation was delicate. Any infraction, any imbalance, any miscegenation or sexual misconduct could explode into full-scale chaos. Yet, from the beginning, the Sisters of the Holy Family brought together black women of all shapes who defied the ways we have allowed things like skin tone or speech pattern or degree of education to be a sign of division and self-hatred. This free black woman of color turned and faced the real black bodies that ended up at the slave ports and the creolized societies of New Orleans and Beth Ties them into self-love. She, like baby Suggs Holy of Toni Morrison's novel Beloved, told her folks there in the clearing in the woods, love your eyes and your limbs and your hands because them out there don't love them. Right on, sister. And lastly, you saw the story of Julia Denver's Angel of Charity, Greeley. She becomes the classic type of the humble, self-effacing Black woman who is often canonized because she served in docility in the white community. Even in her recent icon, as you saw, she is drawn along the stereotype of a Black mammy of sorts, holding a white child in her arms. But talk about someone whose life and witness 
must be placed outside the box of docility and into a real, probably pretty interesting backstory. For centuries now, Black women famous for their song or acting or beauty in the white world have had to enter through back doors, denied access to hotel facilities, banned from speaking outside the theater. Fame does not erase their race, it amplifies it. Leontine Price, Dorothy Dandridge, Eartha Kitt, Lena Horne, and so many others all told stories that could all be named, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Throughout the history of our country, throughout the history of our country, the defiant speech of Sojourner Truth is echoed in the lives of these black women. You remember that she is said to have stood up in the crowd of white suffragette women whose husbands had come to take them back home. And she said, that man over there says that woman needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody helps me into carriages or lifts me over ditches, ditches, and ain't I a woman? And I am a woman, look at me, look at my arm. I plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get and bear the lashes well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most of them sold into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me and ain't I a woman. I believe that Julia Greeley's backstory will come to light, we'll see. And she will be more than Denver's angel of charity because nobody helped her into carriages or carried her over mud puddles either. Nobody knew what she endured working in the houses of people who would have to ask in so many ways, are you a woman? Nobody knows the trouble she saw but Jesus. Folks, these are just a few, a few personal imaginings, possible paths, all serving a greater cause to counter, to counter the stereotypes and the meta narratives that often put saints of color back in their place, romanticizing their realities. This is a challenge to those who cannot see Theobola, the Black Mississippian who spoke truth to the power of the bishops. A challenge for those who do not know about people, the people of Augusta Toton who had to cross rivers with children in their arms over and over and over again. A call to all who cannot realize the secret aggressions persons like Julia Greeley had to endure, could not see the backstories of the worker women and the servant women who, like the psalmist writes, had to keep their eyes on the hand of their mistress, know the mistress's ways, anticipate her moods, while the mistress had to do none of the same. It's tempting for some to see the humble man Pierre Toussaint serving humbly, but never thinking, planning, carrying out a dream of emancipation. I want to ask us all to put ourselves into the lives of the holy women like Henri and Delille and Mary Elizabeth Lang, who could never be anything but black and beautiful even if they tried to be white and pure, which they did not. No people who have not themselves longed to be free can understand those who long for it night and day, who have to say, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, who have to sing, hold on just a little bit longer, hold on because everything is going to be all right, who had to shout, Satan had me down, but Jesus lifted me, who had to come down church aisles singing, we're marching, we're marching up to Zion, tis the beautiful city of God, we're marching, we're marching up to Zion, tis the beautiful, tis the glorious, tis the victorious city of God, and who still are singing, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. 
and go home to my God and be free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few uh, questions. So if anybody here would like to ask a question or uh, those of you who are on Zoom, if you want to type a question into the chat, we're welcome to do that. We'll just spend a few minutes. Anything? So, <laughs> Sharon, are there any uh, on the chat? Okay. Well, if you uh, gave a great presentation, so and, uh, <laughs> and uh, just to point out that several of these uh, saints are present in the tapestry here at the Ministry Center. So, uh, President Harris, do you have a question or comment? So, so your question, your question was, uh, the individual that you're talking about today, the likelihood of Probably, most likely, too, is to be at this point, because he's already been pushed by the nation's prayer, and there's a lot of, uh, the fact that he's, the time period, the fact that he was actually born in slavery, and he had all these issues. I think that would be important. I'm wondering uh, how he does it. Would be given her own kind of very modern uh, post 60s kind of uh, consciousness. Uh, and then uh, and perhaps, depending on you know, how translation is, depends on how a duly grievance caused those. I haven't really thought that much about it, but I think there's a lot uh, in those saints. Uh, and that's one reason why I kind of begin to talk about stuff, saying that uh, as we are canonizing. Even the people that seem very docile, uh, there is something in the backstory that must be told about them. Put ourselves in the place where we really get to whether it canonized or not. Well, I'd like to thank Ken very much once more. Do you have a question, Sean? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ah, very good. And yeah. My question is, um, is there, are there questions around one um, candidate in their proximity to the Yeah, that is a really good question. I actually teach like African and African diaspora religions. And, you know, there in Louisiana, there's such a mixture there. Um, that will present itself a challenge to, to the Catholic canonization process. You know, mixture of races, of religions, there's Baldoon, uh, you know, there's, there's a little juju, okay, you know, and, and there's so much that what is called that, that is demonized. And so uh, kind of surrounds her. I think we should take that as a challenge to look back into their own religious legacies, as I said, spiritual legacies, and realize, you know, how they have, which is a natural process, transformed Catholicism, certainly Louisiana, which is, I lived in for a while, has really made it a, a very rich and very much enculturated type of Catholicism. It's nothing sterile about Catholicism in New Orleans, I can tell you, <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. So I think there's a lot of possibility for the future in that, but it does raise the critical question it must be presented, I think, to the to the process. Are you willing to accept the an, an environment in which African religious expression uh, is combined with Catholicism, and, and how it can bring forth something something new for the future? I don't know if I can answer. <laughs> yes. Um, I really appreciate the 